Professor Stanley Krippner. Muchas gracias por sus palabras bonitas. Estoy muy feliz de estar aquí hoy. You see, there has not been enough emphasis upon Latin America this week. But, and there not have been enough women speaking this week. But we're going to change all of that within the next 90 minutes because I have some distinguished guests who will be assisting me in this presentation and I will be presenting them a little bit later. Now, I know that not everybody is here for the talk, so I'm going to share with you all an anecdote that the others will just have to miss out on. Two days ago, Jose Sula and I spoke about the ayahuasca religions in Brazil. And anybody who has come into contact with ayahuasca has, by and large, come in contact with what we call parapsychological experiences. But I'd like to share one with you. A friend of mine from Spain, Christopher Ryan, and I were in southern Brazil, and we were invited to the Uniao de Vegetal Church for an ayahuasca service, which was a great honor. And it's off in the rainforest, the southern rainforest. So we got into a van with several other church members. And as we were driving into the rainforest, my friend Chris said, look at that beautiful Brazilian woman. She is dressed in a green sari, and she has an orange cast mark and red henna hair, very distinctive. I looked out, I don't see anybody. Oh well, we're going too fast, but I hope she's going to be at the church with us. And I said, well, I hope so. I would like to meet her after this buildup. So we get to the church, and the people are busy preparing the food for the post-service festivities. And there she is, this beautiful Brazilian woman with a cast mark, red henna hair, and a green sari. And my friend Chris said, how did you get here so fast? I saw you as we were driving to the church. And she said, what do you mean? I've been here working in the kitchen for the last five hours. So this is what we call an anomalous parapsychological experience. And that was before drinking the ayahuasca. <laughs> so when you come into contact with the ayahuasca energy, any number of anomalous events can happen. Now, an anomalous event is an unusual event, it's a strange event, it's an uncommon event, and my colleagues and I have a whole book filled with these events in your friendly bookstore. It's called The Varieties of Anomalous Experience. Please buy it, because this was published by the American Psychological Association. It's the first time that the American Psychological Association has published a book on this nature. It's one of their best sellers. And if it keeps on selling, I want them to publish a book, The Varieties of Anomalous Psychedelic and Drug Experiences, because we couldn't get that into the first book. So, parapsychologists investigate reported experiences and behaviors that appear to transcend mainstream science's understanding of time, space, and energy, and have used such terms as telepathy, clairvoyance, and precognition, and psychokinesis to describe these experiences. Some parapsychologists also study so-called past life experiences and after-death communication from deceased people. Now, if you want a complete copy of this presentation, just look at my website, and you'll also find a color photograph of our dear friend Albert and my two German friends, John Weinhold from Heidelberg and John Walker from Hamburg, in front of this beautiful psychedelic colored van during a recent visit to Basel. Little did we know that we'd be in Basel again within the next year. 
All of this goes back in the United States to William James, the first eminent psychologist in the United States, and he ingested peyote at the suggestion of his friend E. Weir Mitchell. But instead of attaining an aesthetic or a mystical or a parapsychological experience, as Mitchell had promised him, James developed a severe stomach ache. When he recovered from the nausea, James refused to take peyote again, telling Mitchell, I will take the visions on trust. However, James's experience with nitrous oxide were more successful. After inhaling the colorful gas for the first time, he experienced a profound alteration in consciousness. Further work with laughing gas led James to write his famous statement that the normal everyday awareness is only one type of conscious experience. Noting that other experiences exist that are worthy of investigation, the famed psychologist concluded, no account of the universe in its totality can be final that leaves these other forms of consciousness quite disregarded. William James was a founder of the American Society for Psychical Research, an organization that pioneered the investigation of so-called parapsychological phenomena. And I've already told you the basic topics that parapsychologists study. Even though experiences with LSD-type substances are unpredictable, and even though parapsychological experiences tend to be intangible, there are some logical reasons to suggest that the former experiences might be conducive to the occurrence of the latter. My friend David Luke has written a whole article about this in the current issue of MAPS, and so I would recommend you to the MAPS that you all have in your folder for a more thorough discussion of these associations. There is considerable research that suggests that reports of parapsychological experiences occur during states of consciousness that are marked by an increase in mental imagery that is unusually vivid and detailed. The occurrence of transpersonal experiences that seem to transcend one's identity. An alteration in body perception, including so-called out-of-body experiences. The incidence of dissociation in which one's flow of awareness is interrupted, an increase in absorption and focused attention, an increase in empathy and feelings of closeness with other people, enhanced emotional flexibility, intensity, and fluidity, an increase in alertness, attention, and awareness, an increase in spontaneity and the impression that one has become more creative, an increase in sensitivity to environmental changes, an increase in suggestibility and responsiveness to others, enhanced intuitive processes and awareness of one's internal thoughts, an increased openness to occurrences once thought to be impossible, a reduction in critical faculties and skeptical thought patterns, an increased feeling that space and time have been transcended. Now, these experiences are neither good or bad, healthy or unhealthy, they're just characteristics of both parapsychological experiences and experiences with LSD-type drugs. In addition to these temporary changes that might be conducive to subjective parapsychological experiences, and remember we're talking about experiences here, we're not saying that these phenomena actually exist. We're talking about the subjective experiences people report. So it's arguable that long-term ideological alterations in, might include, including, might involve including changes in one's concept of reality and one's ability to utilize presumptive parapsychological skills. For example, my dear friend, the renowned medium Eileen Garrett, asserted that the use of LSD had enhanced her sensitivity and accuracy. In the meantime, several studies had revealed a small but consistent relationship between drug use and belief in the existence of parapsychological phenomena. This was especially evident in Charles Tart's study of marijuana users. Now, Eileen Garrett was the most famous medium of the 20th century, and she did a great deal of work with scientists. And at one conference in southern France, Walter Pankey had brought along some LSD and some photographic film. And the task was 
for Eileen Garrett and another renowned medium by the name of Douglas Johnson to try to make an imprint on the film after taking LSD. So I was sort of the assistant, and after the two of them were tripping merrily away, out came the photographic film. And Walter Pank said, put this on the part of your body that exerts the most psychic energy and see if you can put a mark upon the film. So Eileen clasped the film to her bosom. Douglas clasped the film to his crotch. And we waited expectantly. The film was developed, sorry, blank. Try again sometime. But at least they had a good trip. Another reason for investigating the links between reported parapsychological experiences and LSD-type substances is the exploration of the accompanying brain mechanisms. And here we have a number of possibilities. The UK psychologist, Serena Roney Dougal, for example, has proposed a model based on the action of the pineal gland in response to ayahuasca. And this is the Amazonian brew that contains the alkaloid harmaline, once dubbed telepathine because of its alleged evocation of telepathy. This reminds me of another story. I was in New York City at a meeting of the Parapsychological Association, and J.B. Ryan, the founder of modern day parapsychology, gave a talk, and there in the audience was Allen Ginsberg. And he came running up to J.B. Ryan saying, I've just written a book called the Yahe Papers, and this telepathine, which is in Yahe, gives you uncanny telepathic powers. You should really investigate it. And J.B. Ryan listened very courteously, and then he had to leave, and so I was interested, and so I talked with Alan and heard more about it. This was the beginning of a beautiful friendship. And I encountered Alan several times since then, but he got me interested in telepathine and in harmaline and therefore in ayahuasca. And I thought, I'm going to take those substances someday. And sure enough, I ended up at a hospital, Maimonides Hospital in Brooklyn, and on hospital stationery, I wrote to a drug company in Milwaukee and ordered some harmaline, and they sent it to me, no questions asked. And so I had my harmaline experiences years before I tried ayahuasca. Of course, once the uh, uh, police started to crack down upon such substances, we had sort of an experimental party and used up all the harmaline so it wouldn't fall into the wrong hands. But those were in the days when you could order things by mail and get them within a few days. So, Rick Strassman has hypothesized a role for DMT similar to that suggested by Roni Dougal. He has implicated the overproduction of DMT and its effects on the pineal gland in states ranging from psychosis to mysticism. Ketamine, an, aesthet an anesthetic that induces dissociation, has been associated with so-called near-death experiences, some of which contain purported parapsychological elements. Janssen has hypothesized that ketamine acts by binding to the PCP site of the MD M MDA receptors, blocking the action of the neurotransmitter glutamine. And Michael Winkleman has used the term psychointegrators to describe the way that LSD substances apparently integrate various portions and functions of the brain and nervous system. If there are visionary molecules in the human brain and body, it's likely that they served an adaptive purpose in the evolution of the species. Hence, the investigation of this topic may have critical implications for biology, evolutionary psychology, and anthropology. Now, if the translators will bear with me, I'm going to skip to page seven and talk about the clinical and anecdotal data because once we get into anthropology, I'm going to pull upon the help of uh, our distinguished uh, uh, panel. And I hope that will be very, very soon. There are several anecdotal and clinical case studies on record in which the ingestion of LSD-type substances resulted in presumptive parapsychological experiences. Some of you know about Stan Groff's account regarding two of his friends who were vacationing in Maine. 
One of them, Peter, which is a pseudonym, went scuba diving and never returned. Consequently, his wife Penny, also a pseudonym, had difficulty accepting her husband's death. This was especially problematic for her because his body had never been found. During a psychotherapeutic LSD session with Groff, Penny reported communicating with Peter, who explained that yes, he was in fact dead and yes, his body would not be found. But more important, Peter gave Penny specific instructions concerning each of their children and requested that she get on with her life. Peter then asked Penny to return a book that he had borrowed from a friend, giving Penny the book's name, the title of the book, and the location of the book in the house. All of this information was correct, for whatever reason. And Penny returned the book to its owner. Following this dramatic experience, Penny was able to accept Peter's death and to begin working through her grief. And Stan Groff has given me permission to give the real names of these people. This, of course, was the late Walter Pankey, who tragically died in a scuba diving accident off the coast of New England. A less spectacular report was contributed by Robert Masters and Jean Houston, who described the case of a homemaker who, in the course of her LSD session with them, claimed that she could see her daughter in the kitchen of the home looking for the cookie jar and breaking a sugar bowl in the attempt to get to the top shelf. Well, when the woman returned home, she was looking for the sugar bowl. And she said, where is the sugar bowl? And her husband said, well, I have bad news. Your daughter broke the sugar bowl because she was hunting for the cookie jar. And on her way up to the top, she knocked the cookie bowl, the, the sugar bowl, off the counter, and it broke. So again, for whatever reason, that could be a subjective uh, parapsychological experience. One evening, a psychiatrist by the name of Margaret Paul ate an Amanita mushroom in her laboratory, miles from the office where she usually conducted her psychotherapeutic practice. Her experience included intense visual imagery alternating between an atomic bomb explosion and an appreciation of what she called the power of love. At the very time of her Amanita session, a client of hers, who we'll call Jim, unaccountably went to a grocery store and bought mushrooms. He had never bought mushrooms before. He had never cooked mushrooms before. But he ate them with a hamburger, had had an anxiety attack, fearing that an atomic bomb explosion was imminent. No, these are not psychedelic mushrooms. Another client of hers, Joan, during the same evening, insisted, insisted that a close friend of hers, Gina, drive her to the home of a man for whom she was secretly in love. Joan sat in her, cars, in her friend's car for two hours, yearning to burst into the room and talk about the power of love, the same power of love that Dr. Paul had come into contact with during her mushroom session. And it was only Gina's vigilance that prevented her from entering that man's house and throwing herself into his arms. Both Jim and Joan had an experience in parapsychology and both had strong emotional attachments to the psychotherapist. And Dr. Paul hypothesized that these two highly irrational acts, which probably put their therapy back three months, might have been telepathically triggered through her Amanita mushroom experience. The Canadian psychologist Duncan Blewett reported the case of a teacher who took LSD under his direction, and her experience was conceptual rather than veridical but it indicates a worldview closely associated with parapsychological experiences. She told Duncan Blewett, I was outside of our dimensions of space and time, and I felt an understanding of infinity. The understanding was so broad and so universal that it forestalled all questions. Questions such as, what is beyond space? which had previously posed an intellectual problem and had no meaning for me since the answer was other spaces, an infinity of them, like a Chinese puzzle box. So Blewett administered a questionnaire of 100 to 147 of his research participants within a week following their LSD experience. The questions were, did you feel that you were aware of new dimensions of thought? Did you feel an awareness of several levels of awareness? Did you feel that you were able to think on different levels? Now, this was done back in the early 60s. 
and Blewett recommended the use of LSD-type substances in parapsychological research. He concluded perhaps the greatest impact of these compounds will stem from the development of new methods and techniques designed to meet the challenge which they offer as research tools. Well, let's hope they do someday. We're still waiting. Anecdotal reports involving psychokinesis, so-called mind over matter, are less common than those involving telepathy, mind-to-mind -mind communication, clairvoyance, remote perception, precognition, viewing the future. Of course, these are all hypothetical constructs. However, Professor Dean Brown related an incident when he took LSD under the direction of the famous Al Hubbard, an early advocate of the substance. While driving back to Las Vegas following their LSD session together in the mountains of Nevada, Hubbard asked Brown to take a dollar bill out of his wallet. Hubbard then proceeded to identify each of the 10 serial numbers and letters, not only of that bill, but of several others. Now, if this report is accurate, and if it was not due to sleight of hand, because I've seen magicians do similar things, it would serve as an example of clairvoyance. Hubbard confided that he had developed these skills through his previous use of LSD. However, Hubbard later insisted that they enter a casino in Las Vegas, which, according to Dr. Brown's account, Hubbard was able to use psychokinesis to influence several gaming machines to pay off in his favor. However, Hubbard's reputation was well known in the casino, and after he had earned his maximum money, he was politely escorted out. They said, we don't want Al Hubbard in here. He wins too much money. Yeah. Now, there's another example that I thought would be an example of psychokinesis. I checked into it. Now, I was wrong, but it makes a good story. When I was visiting Millbrook, Al, which of course with Timothy Leary's retreat in upstate New York, courtesy of two rich siblings, there was a little house off to the side, and in that house lived this strange monk called the Mad Monk of Millbrook. He was taking LSD every single day. And I thought, if that won't fry his brains, nothing will. And I wanted to meet him to see if there were deleterious effects of LSD after all of this experimentation he'd been doing. And I said, oh, he wanders around. We don't dare disturb him. He's lost in meditation. And I said, well, you know, for the sake of science, I don't think he'd mind a little interruption. And besides, the mad monk of Millbrook was supposed to be practicing levitation, and that's psychokinesis. So I interrupted the mad monk of Millbrook on one of his wanderings, and I found out he wasn't mad at all. He was very lucid, and he spoke very knowledgeably about Buddhist thought. And so, a few weeks later, I was invited by Tim up to his marriage, uh, one of his many marriages, this one was to a beautiful Swedish model. And the uh, first time and only time I've seen Tim in a tuxedo, and Ram Das was there also in a tuxedo, and Tim's son Jack was also there in a tuxedo. And his uh, lovely daughter, who came to a tragic end, his lovely daughter was there in a very formal gown. And after the uh, elegant wedding with Shiva and Shakti on the wedding cake, off the two of them went to honeymoon in India. And as some of you know, the marriage didn't survive the trip to India. But she came back to Millbrook, and before anybody knew what was happening, she ran off with the mad monk from Millbrook, and they got married. Well, the mad monk of Millbrook, as some of you know, was Robert Thurman, now the esteemed Buddhist scholar and the advisor to the Dalai Lama, and he and the beautiful Swedish model have a lovely, intelligent daughter by the name of Uma Thurman. No genetic damage there, no brain cells ruined by daily doses of LSD. So Thurman doesn't talk too much about this experience, but with this crowd, I think it's okay that I tell the story. Dr. Jean Millay got her PhD at Saybrook with a test involving uh, psychedelics and, tel and presumptive telepathy. 
Uh, I work at Saybrook Graduate School, one of the few accredited graduate schools in the United States where you can study these substances. In fact, one of our very first dissertations was on LSD psychotherapy. And Dr. May re Malay reported an incident that occurred when her young daughter Maya was visiting her father, Malay's former husband in the Carolyn Islands. When Maya did not return at the appointed time, Malay ingested mescaline attempting to clear her mind of any distracting influences. After four hours of clearing, Malay had the impression that she had made contact with Maya. Her daughter seemed to tell Malay that there had been a problem with vaccinations and transportation, and it would be explained in a letter. The slow boat from the Caroline Islands was very, very slow. She also had an image of her daughter holding an animal that resembled a raccoon. Maya's letter arrived as predicted, and the information about vaccinations and travel logistics was correct. What about the animal? Well, Maya had tamed a colorful jungle pheasant and tried to smuggle it home in her backpack. When her father discovered the plan, he became angry and killed the pheasant. What connection does the pheasant have to a raccoon? Well, both Millet and her daughter recalled that as a child, she had bought a raccoon at a pet store. But as it grew older, the animal terrorized the neighborhood. A neighbor threatened to shoot the animal, but a solution was reached in which their raccoon was taken um, back to the zoo, pet store, and the pet store gave it to a zoo. Now, before we leave these clinical and anecdotal anecdotes, I'll tell one of my own. I was actually one of the last legal participants in Tim Leary's experience, experiments at Harvard. And I had read the Life magazine article about Maria Sabine in the late 1950s, and I thought, I want to take those mushrooms someday, little realizing that I would also meet Mia, Maria Sabina, but you'll hear about that later. And so when Tim Leary came on the scene, I wrote a letter of application, and I was invited to Harvard. I went into his office. We had a half-hour conversation, and he paid me one of the great compliments of my life. He said, Dr. Krippner, you're exactly the type of person who I want to take the psilocybin substance. <laughs> so we arranged a session the next day, and he personally invited me to a reception he was having for the visiting professor, Alan Watts, who also became a friend of mine. So the next day, um, in a very comfortable room, I took the psilocybin with a friend of mine, Steve, who was a student at Harvard. And without going into details, which you can find if you're interested in the Osmond Aronson book, Psychedelics, I had images of delicate Moorish arabesques and Persian miniature paintings I went on a whirlwind tour of France, Spain, New York, and Baltimore. I ended up in Washington, D.C., where I found myself gazing at a bust of Abraham Lincoln. While watching the features from the side in profile, they began to darken, and somebody whispered, he was shot, the president was shot. A whiff of smoke rose from a gun and curled into the air. And then Lincoln's features faded away, and those of the current president, John F. Kennedy, took their place. The wisp of smoke was still there, but now from a rifle, not from a gun, and a voice repeated, he was shot, the president was shot. I opened my eyes and they were dripping with tears. And for whatever reason, this tragic premonition was confirmed the following year. Now at the beginning of our psilocybin session, I attempted to administer a psychological test to my friend. We thought this would be the first Stanford Binet intelligence test given under psilocybin. We got to the second question and we burst out laughing. We thought, how funny, how silly, how stupid this is. So that was the end of that little abortive attempt. But a few years later, I got to meet Mickey Hart and Jerry Garcia of the Grateful Dead, and they thought it would be a really neat thing to do an experiment during one of their gigs in New York, Port Chester, New York to be specific. At that time, I was working at the Dream Laboratory at Maimonides Medical Center in Brooklyn, and an English medium, Malcolm Besson, volunteered to attempt dreaming about an art print that would be projected on a large screen in back of the band. 
So if you can imagine the Grateful Dead playing, if you can imagine half or more of the audience in altered states of consciousness to do one, do, due to one substance or another, in back, you are going to see a picture in a few minutes. Try transmitting this picture to Malcolm Besant. He is in Brooklyn at the Maimonides Hospital Dream Laboratory. And then randomly, just at that second, a picture of several pictures was chosen and flashed on the screen. Now in the meantime, there was a control subject. The control subject was at home in Brooklyn. The audience knew nothing about the control subject, but she tried to tune in on the picture also. The control subject got completely chance results. Besson's results were borderline significant. It was only six nights. You can't get too many details or data from six nights. But Besson did fairly well. And one night, the seven spinal chakras by the artist Scralian was flashed on the screen. And Besson had one dream about natural energy, another dream about an energy box, and another dream about a spinal column. And some of the other pictures yielded uh, similar items of great interest. So, I think the most interesting and the most useful future work in studying the connection between um, psychedelics and parapsychological experiences is the anthropological data. And the anthropological and ethnobotanical literature is replete with examples of its ostensibly parapsychological phenomena occurring with the traditional use of psychoactive plants. The ritual use of psychoactive plants to induce purported parapsychological skills is commonplace among indigenous people actually from all over the world. And just to give you some uh, um, some examples, you have the use of ibogaine in many, many parts of Africa. You have the use of substances in um, Morocco. Actually, the, uh, uh, there's a shrub with a harmal alkaloid, and it's used specifically for purported clairvoyance. Rural communities in India have premonitions through smoking or eating cannabis derivatives. There's the Paturi in Australian Aboriginal tribes, San Pedro cactus among indigenous groups in Peru, Amanita mushrooms among Siberian tribes, the Ojibwe in Canada, peyote among the Mexican huicholes, psilocybin mushrooms, of course, among the Mazatecs, thorn apple seeds by the Delphic oracles of ancient Greece, and the list goes on and on and on. Schultes and Hoffman, in a book that many of you have, identified some 100 psychoactive plants that were employed to access visionary states by traditional people, a practice especially common among shamans and shamanic healers in hunting and gathering societies. My anthropology professor at Northwestern University, William McGovern, was one of the first anthropologists to investigate the use of ayahuasca, also called yahe, the vine of the soul, on an expedition to Peru back in the 1920s. He published his book in about 1930. And here's one thing that he noted. Curiously enough, certain of the Indians fell into a particularly deep state of trance in which they possessed what appeared to be telepathic powers. Two or three of the men described in great detail what was going on. Hundreds of miles away, more extraordinarily still on this particular evening, the local medicine man told me that the chief of a certain tribe on the faraway Parana River had suddenly died. I entered the state into my diary, and many weeks later, when we came to the tribe in question, I found out that his statement had been true in every detail. Another early report was submitted by Zer de Bayan, who related the case of a Colonel Morales, who, after ingesting a similar substance in Peru, beheld an image of his dead father and his ailing sister, both of whom had been in good health when he last saw them. But a few weeks later, he received the same sad news from a messenger. Western culture, as you know, severed the connection between psychoactive plants and visionary states. Zoroaster banned the use of the Hauma plant in Persia. The Eleusinian rituals in Greece fell into disrepute. You heard the story about that two days ago. 
The witches were persecuted during the Inquisition, one reason being that yeah, they used henbane, belladonna, mandrake, and datura. Another reason is they were simply better healers than the male physicians who teamed up with the church to get rid of them. A combination of changing concepts of illness, the development of sedentary societies, the influence of monotheistic religions and colonization resulted in the virtual disappearance of traditional employment of psychoactive plants for parapsychological purposes in most of Europe and North America and much of the rest of the so-called civilized world. In the, in the 1967 report, however, Claudio Noranio described his experiment with 30 volunteer participants who ingested a harmaline preparation with no knowledge of its usage in the Amazonian rainforest, and many of their reports included images of jaguars, jungles, and dark-skinned men and women. And some of them imagined they were flying. When I took harmaline from the chemical laboratories, same thing, I had these beautiful images of jaguars and jungles and snakes, so beautiful if I were an artist like Pablo Amaringo, I would have recorded them uh, just as I had visualized them. Some of you know about Jeremy Narby's experiment, and if you don't, buy his marvelous book, 500 Years of Shamans, a classic book out in the bookstore. He introduced three Western scientists to shamanic practitioners in the Amazonian rainforest and they administered ayahuasca. The scientists brought unsolved technical problems with them and each reported key insights resulting from the session. In discussing the origins of the brew, Narby commented, here are people without electron microscopes who choose among 80,000 Amazonian plant species, the leaves of a bush containing a brain hormone, DMT, which they combine with a vine containing substances that inactivate an enzyme of the digestive tract, the MAO inhibitor, which would otherwise block the effect. And they do this to modify their consciousness. It's as if they knew about the molecular properties of plants and the art of combining them. And one asks them how they know these things, they say their knowledge comes directly from the plants. Well, that's as good an explanation, isn't it, as far as I'm concerned. So, I have a special connection with Maria Sabina because I saw her photograph in Life magazine. Little did I know that I would be eating the mushrooms, and a few years after eating the mushrooms, I would meet Maria Sabina, and this is because of my delightful encounter with Salvador Roquette, the brilliant Mexican psychiatrist who we really have to mention this week because much of his work is unknown. And I got a letter from Salvador Roquette out of nowhere, out of the blue, inviting me to Mexico City to see his psychedelic psychotherapy. It was a group therapy session like I have never seen. Everybody was taking some type of psychoactive drug, and on the screen he was showing a violent movie, and on the sides naked men and women were being flashed by a slide projector, while a variety of music, ranging from rock music to classical music to Mexican folk music, was playing off and on on the tape recorder. A wild session, if I had an extra hour, I would tell you about the session. But the point is, Salvador and I became good friends. I brought him to the United States. I introduced him to the Spring Grove people, the Stan Groff, and that was his entree into the psychedelic stream. And as time went on, he met uh, many, many other people. Fortunately, we have with us today some slides of, uh, of Salvador Roquette, and we have some slides of Maria Sabina, and I'm going to have Linda Rosa Corazon show them to you. First of all, I should introduce our distinguished guests. Like I say, let's balance things out at least for an hour and get some women, some uh, people from Latin America and some Hispanics into the mix. <laughs> this is Linda Rosa Corazon from Skyline College in California. <laughs> this is Ricardo Jensen from the Orenda Institute. And this is Luis Eduardo Luna 
from the University of Florianopolis, where he directs the Research Center for the Study of Psychointegrator Plants, Visionary Art, and Consciousness, and he is doing a marvelous class in June. If you want details, tell him about it. I'm shameless in terms of the way I plug my friends' books and programs, pardon me. So, Lewis. Okay, first of all, we will hear from Linda Rosa. Well, thank you, Stan, for the opportunity to uh, speak at this very wonderful and important conference, and uh, uh, very, very grateful to all of those that organized it, and of course to uh, Albert Hoffman uh, for the wonderful and miraculous LSD. But as uh, Stan was saying, I think it's also very important that we uh, honor and remember at this conference indigenous people uh, such as the Weecholes, uh, as Stan mentioned, that have had an unbroken tradition of working with peyote in northern Mexico. Uh, people like the Schwar and other Amazon peoples that, again, have had thousands of years tradition working with ayahuasca. And, of course, the Mazatecs in southern uh, Mexico that have been working with the mushrooms. And these people revere these sacred medicines. They're the central uh, sacred element in their culture, so much so that the Mazatecs called the mushrooms Diositos, the little gods. And um, it just so happens that uh, I have today uh, a sacred prayer and chant uh, by a Mazatec shaman, my friend Inez Garcia, who was the translator for Maria Sabina because Maria Sabina did not speak Spanish and she was the translator for Maria Sabina from the age of nine years old. Uh, she related to me also that she translated John Lennon's session with Maria Sabina uh, when I last saw her in July. So I think these are just very important elements in our psychedelic history. So we recorded this prayer and chant during a mushroom ceremony uh, in Huautla de Jimenez, conducted by Inez in July, and I'd like to just briefly offer this prayer and chant to you as a blessing and a message from our brothers and sisters, the native people. Y a cuatro puntos cardinales, norte, sur, este, oeste, en el mar de tierra. Que catarroca o que catacica se en diálin, ahí, cuando ha pasado, en el nombre de Dios y Santo, la Santísima Divinidad, Padre, Hijo, Espíritu Santo. Amén. Thank you, thank you. Um, Stan also asked me to speak a little bit about the Mexican psychiatrist Salvador Roquette, who, uh, maybe we could get that white down so we, we could see Salvador. <laughs> Anyway, he's behind the slides there. Um, if we could maybe adjust that. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to tell you uh, how I came to meet Salvador Roquette and then uh, 
talk a little bit about his work because he really is a pioneer in the field of psychedelic psychotherapy and also is an important part of our psychedelic history that we've been discussing here at the conference. I basically started using psychedelics in 1970, mainly uh, at Grateful Dead concerts, and the Grateful Dead also are a very important part of our psychedelic history because I think many of us, um, you know, had many uh, positive psychedelic experiences uh, through them and the music and uh, the community. But in 1973, I went to Latin America. I kind of had read Carlos Castaneda and uh, became interested in um, the indigenous cultures and the sacred medicine. So I went to Latin America, uh, basically as a hippie backpacking traveler, uh, for six months. And when and I encountered indigenous people there, and when I came back, I went to San Francisco State University and saw a flyer for a talk that was called Hallucinogenic Plants of Mexico. And the talk was being offered by Salvador Roquette. Um, I went to the talk and learned the, uh, that Salvador Roquette was a Mexican doctor. He'd once been a director of public health in Mexico. And in that role, he traveled a lot all over Mexico. He was part of a campaign to eradicate malaria. And he came in contact with many indigenous people. Uh, but what happened to him was that in the late 50s, during the process of his training of becoming a psychiatrist, he was offered a mescaline experience by the psychiatrist that was training him. The mescaline was actually administered intravenously, and he had a very, very powerful life-changing experience in which he says he went through hell and, and into heaven. He saw the potential of using substances like mescaline in psychotherapy, but he wasn't quite sure how to go about this and how to get the substances and all of that. And, but he kept this uh, vision and this dream alive for 10 years. Um, in the early 60s, he was in Paris walking down the Boulevard Saint-Michel, and he looked into a bookstore window and saw a book called Les Champignons Hallucinogènes du Mexique, and this is a book by Roger Heim and Gordon Wasson, and as you know, Gordon Wasson was the first person to um, have taken the mushrooms given to him by Maria Sabina from anyone outside the Mazatec culture. And in the book, Salvador discovered that in his own country, there was still an alive tradition using entheogens, the mushrooms, and uh, he decided to go visit Maria Savina. This is uh, their first encounter in 1967 in Wautla, and there's Maria Sabina on the right and her daughter in the middle, Salvador on the left. And from this, uh, first encounter developed a very, very important uh, relationship uh, that lasted for many years in which Salvador would bring his patients, his clients, to Maria Sabina where she would conduct the mushroom ceremony and afterwards Salvador would uh, facilitate hour long, hours long integration of the experience that the individuals had had. And very often, uh, the, he would have the people do writing and drawings before the experience, significant drawings like of uh, your mother, your father, your partner, your children, your work, uh, the world, God. And then you would write and do drawings in addition after the experience. And there was a lot of analysis that was very fascinating of the drawings and readings of the writings as part of this whole integration process. Um, just another one there of Salvador and Maria Sabina. Now, as you know, uh, after the Life Magazine article, uh, and, uh, you know, in the ensuing years, the word got out about Wautla and the so-called magic mushrooms, and many people uh, went up there, and things, to be honest, got a little out of hand, because for the Mazatecs, one always takes the mushrooms in a sacred ceremony facilitated by a shaman, and for healing, and for uh, help and guidance, and this is, you know, the way the Native people see these, these sacred medicines, 
emotions. They they guide their lives and and heal them and help them uh, physically, emotionally, and uh, spiritually. So things got a little out of hand, and uh, after around 1968 or so, uh, the Mexican uh, poli- uh, uh, army closed off Huautla for several years. But out of this situation, something very interesting ensued, and that is that uh, Salvador, this is just another shot of Huautla, and that's, that's actually the original ceremony uh, that Gordon Wasson uh, participated in in 1955 when Maria Sabina was healing that young boy. Another one of Maria Sabina. So what happened is that Salvador, since he couldn't go to Woutla anymore, developed his own form of psychedelic psychotherapy, as Stan was mentioning, uh, that basically involved uh, first these very intense uh, audio-visual presentations that Stan was mentioning, something some, with going from very horrific and disturbing images, Nazis and uh, war and all of this, and people would be starting to take the substances while they were watching the audio-visuals. And then uh, you would be blindfolded and uh, the session would begin basically guided by music. And the idea of this, and Stan Groff uses this kind of a model also, is that the uh, music, the recorded music, is like the shaman's chants, which basically are like the horse that you ride on during the journey. It guides your journey through the different stages. Um, It was a very powerful form of psychedelic psychotherapy and somewhat controversial because of its intensity and because of, uh, you know, some of the the processes, but it was an amazingly uh, effective form of psychedelic psychotherapy, and it was really based on two concepts that were central to Salvador's work, which were love and death. And he developed a very extensive psychedelic uh, theory where he charted out different stages of the psychedelic process and what, you know, the whole, uh, the different stages that the individuals went through. And for him, uh, people's problems uh, were all problems around uh, love and death. He felt that particularly in Western culture, there's a lot of fear of death. And because of fear of death, people get into addictions, materialism, and all of that, and kind of shut down. Uh, And that what he felt that these medicines do is help us to regain, he would say, our lost sensitivity, which he saw that the indigenous people still had very alive through working with these medicines, which, you know, they say, open your heart and open you to communicate directly with the divine. Um, so he felt that, you know, the work was about discovering, particularly those of us in, you know, the more modern cultures, our lost sensitivity and opening our hearts and becoming more loving, human, kind human beings with uh, our families, our friends, and with uh, the Mother Earth and, and the world in general. And I think this is really ultimately what these medicines, LSD and the other ones, are all about, to help us become more loving and responsible individuals. And I think we can kind of feel that in our community. So as Stan mentioned, uh, he invited Salvador to the United States. And here Salvador got to meet other pioneers in the field of psychedelics. And this is a picture of Salvador with Gordon Wasson on the right, and on the left, a a very famous uh, writer of religion, Walter Houston Clark, that also uh, went to Mexico and did work with Salvador. Later, besides doing his own uh, psychedelic psychotherapy sessions, he also, and I worked very closely with him for 20 years, Uh, we would also go on trips in Mexico and still do work with traditional shamans. And I participated in many, many um, psychedelic psychotherapy sessions with Salvador. Uh, These were basically underground in the United States, but he also worked in France, and he worked in Boston, and of course he kept working in Mexico. Unfortunately, just a little bit about uh, Salvador's life and... uh, Uh, 
uh, history is that um, the psychiatric community kind of turned against him in Mexico because his work became really popular and a lot of famous uh, uh, people were working with him, politicians, movie stars, writers, and all of this. So he actually was arrested and put in jail for six months. And so then the work really, really went underground. But I'll show you some other pictures when he was in the United States. Here's a picture. He went to uh, Millbrook and he visited Timothy Leary. And here he is actually in Switzerland with our friend Albert Hoffman. So, um, you know, just to close, I would just like to say um, that, you know, I feel his work is very, very important. It was little known, as Stan said, because he didn't speak English. But um, there is now, a, his biography has been published, and I'm hoping to translate it into English. It's called Una Terapia Prohibida, A Forbidden Therapy, and it's a very fascinating book. And I also do take people on trips to uh, the Mazatecs, to the Schwar uh, uh, in the Amazon, and to the Huichols up in um, the northern Mexico, because uh, I feel it's very important to, uh, if we, one can have the opportunity to have these kinds of experiences directly with the people uh, you know, who've been doing this, as I say, for thousands of years. And it really helps in developing these bonds, I think, of brotherhood and sisterhood. And some of you may know that there is a uh, very important Incan prophecy about the eagle and the condor. And it says the following, that there's going to come a time when the eagle of the north, which is those of us in uh, North America and in Europe, uh, that are going to meet the condor of the south, which represents the native people and the heart, and the eagle is more the mind and the technology, and that they're going to meet and come together, and they're going to fly together in the same sky. And at that point, the children of the earth are going to wake up and know who they are, which are children of the sun and children of the divine. So I wanted to share that prophecy with you. So if you're interested in ever doing any of these journeys, I call them magical medicine tours come up and talk to me afterwards. And I also wanted to just mention to my brothers and sisters in the Bay Area that I'm going to start a monthly salon series in Marin County called Visionary Voices, where I'm going to bring different speakers, including native shamans that I uh, help to bring to the United States. And the first one is going to be on February 12th, and I'm bringing up a Huichol, a very wonderful Huichol shaman from Mexico. And there is this desire on their part also to share their medicine with us because they feel it's very important that as many of us wake up as possible and try to move things in this world in a more positive and, uh, and healthy direction. So thank you very much, and uh, I will turn it over to my uh, very good friend and brother, medicine brother, Richard Jensen, who also worked very, very closely with Salvador Roquette for many, many years, and he has some things to share with you about his experience with Salvador as well. Gracias. Thank you. I want to try to be brief, and uh, in some ways that will be difficult. Um, my friend and colleague and uh, meta-mentor, in a way, Stan Krippner, asked me to come today. He, uh, I call him a meta-mentor because he introduced me to uh, one of my great friends and mentors, Salvador Roquette. Uh, he was at Maimonides Mental Health Center, and he called down to the Maryland Psychiatric Research Center where I was working. And he said he'd met this Mexican psychiatrist who uh, took his patients to work with shamans in the mountains and who worked with a whole variety of different psychedelic drugs in a very intense group process. He was very excited about it. He said we had to meet this person, but the one problem was that the person only spoke Spanish. And it turned out that they didn't know that I was bilingual, and so I told my colleagues that I was bilingual, and, you know, on hearing the story of all of the adventures of this uh, 
Mexican psychiatrist and psychoanalyst, Frommian psychoanalyst, uh, I envisioned a, a young, dynamically handsome Latin American man, perhaps with a mustache. I opened the door to my apartment. He was coming to spend the night before. We were to give an address to the Maryland Psychiatric Research Center. I opened the door and I found a, a, a slender, short, and bow-legged man with a shock of white hair and large black glasses. Looked a little French, actually. I was fresh from studies with Carlos Castaneda and my head was full of Don Juan and the magic of the native peoples of the mountains of Mexico. Many of us that studied with Castaneda had visions of meeting Don Juan one day. That night I met somebody much better. I met a man who integrated the native teachings into his own work, who understood what it is to truly be a shaman while maintaining his presence as a psychoanalyst. He understood about creating experiences for people. He understood about using chaos, using sensory overload, using elements that we as researchers in the United States forbid ourselves to even dream of and to use them with heart and with kindness and with depth. To use confrontation, to use the ability to tell somebody you're avoiding something here, look at it. A very missing element in our psychedelic approach at that time. He was a remarkable individual. We stayed up all night conversing. And the next day we went to the research center and he began presenting his work. My friend, colleague, and mentor Stan Groff had mentioned when uh, he heard that uh, Roquette was coming and what he was doing. Um, there were two elements that really struck Stan um, about Roquette. One was that um, he was using um, Datura thorn apple seeds. This is an, known as an anticholinergic delirogen. It is not recognized as a psychedelic and yet held most sacred by native peoples who use it. So the one question that Stan Groff presented to us is he said this is, a, this is something that produces a true psychosis. This is something that could be of no use in psychotherapy. I don't see how he could possibly use this. This, this will be very interesting. And the other thing was that Roquette was working in groups. And Stan said, we tried this in Czechoslovakia, and LSD in particular produces so much of an opening in the ego that it is extremely difficult to do any kind of group process at all. So I don't understand how he's doing this. So here we are the next day presenting. And Salvador starts off and he says, well, I use morning glory seeds. I use psilocybin containing mushrooms. I use LSD. I use ketamine. This was something we had never heard of. He said, you've never heard of ketamine? Why, it's made by Lilly Company, an American company. And Salvador was actually the one with a, an anesthesiologist colleague who discovered the usefulness of ketamine in psychotherapy. Um, and then he said, I use Datura. Stan Groff's hand goes up. How are you able to use Datura? Datura just produces a madness. Salvador says, yes, and madness is a very necessary element. It is the reason why the Aztecs felt that the Ololiuqui, the morning glory seeds, and the Datura were sisters, because used together they were more helpful than separated. Not in the same session, 
but that in his process, the Datura took people to this inner madness that was an upwelling of the unconscious that broke all resistances, even those that formed to a series of psychedelic sessions. And he would work with the material that came out in subsequent sessions. So he outlined a complex process of using many different substances, many different stimuli. Stan's hand comes up again. We tried to work with group process in Czechoslovakia. We couldn't do it. The ego is too altered. How were you able to do it? We had to resort to individual sessions because it was the only way we could contain this experience. Salvador says, well, I've worked with individual psychotherapy sessions as well, and I find them really helpful, but there is something in the group process that's unique to the group process and that's extremely powerful as the entire group approaches a mystical experience together, and it's a shared experience amongst all the members of the group. And it's really remarkable the way one person's work will trigger another person. The hand comes up again. No, 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 no. I understand what you're saying, but that's not my question. Of course, I'm translating this. In this encounter, I'm providing translation for Salvador both ways simultaneously. How do you do this, Dr. Roquette? How, do you, how are you able to do this? And the answer came. With great skill. There were no more questions from Stan. <laughs> It was his, the remarkable gift of his charisma, the remarkable gift of his clinical skill, and it was his downfall as well, that with great skill he did this. He was arrested, he was imprisoned. Uh, it was extremely difficult for him to pass on this great skill to others. With some hope, we hope, that it will be possible to write more about Roquette. I'm the president of his foundation. Um, he is dead. And um, we hope to be able to honor him and carry on some of his work and bring some of the ideas of his work into mainstream use in, in the mainstream of psychedelic therapy, <laughs> the mainstream of an eddy. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Now we're going to hear from Luis Eduardo Luna. Thank you. Well, um, uh, um, Ralph uh, mentioned the flying of the condor and the eagle, and also Rosa mentioned it. Of course, I'm no condor from the, Ama from the Andes. I'm just a mosquito from the Amazon, <laughs> but I'm flying to the eagle. Um, I have just two remarks to make uh, um, regarding uh, the work presented by uh, Stanley Krippner. Um, I've been working for many years as an anthropologist uh, with ayahuasca in the Peruvian Amazon, uh, both in the in Peruvian Amazon and the Brazilian Amazon. Um, one, uh, uh, Stanley mentioned the astonishment of Jeremy and many others who said, how do they find the combination, and it's not only the combination of Banisteriopsis-Capi and Cicotrivilidis, but also the combination of Banisteriopsis-Capi and Diplopteros cabrenada, which also contains the same alkaloid, the methotryptamine. But this is just the tip of the iceberg because there are many other plants used in the Amazon. They call it doctores, plant teachers, and how they were able to find all these plants in a flora as rich as the Amazon with 80,000 species or more. I've been asking the, the, the Indians, uh, you know, the shamans about this, and you know, the answer is usually that, dreams, visions. That is the way they get this knowledge from. 
Then, when I was working in the, with the Brazilian churches, I, I was for almost five years professor of anthropology in Florianópolis, southern Brazil, and then I had a, a, a good occasion to uh, work with the churches, made interviews, and I was uh, puzzled about the people who go and find the plants in the forest. They call it pesquisar because the, 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 these churches, they, are, they have thousands of, of members. They have, I was used to the Peruvian ceremonies with 10, 12 people. In the Brazil, you have hundreds of people taking ay uh, uh, ayahuasca together in, in churches, and they need sometimes great quantities of the, of the plants. And so I was talking to the people who did the pesquisa. They went to the forest and uh, or to find the, the, the plants. The answer was the same, visions and dreams. So this is very puzzling. And then with my friend Ede Fresca from the Institute of, National Institute of Psychiatry and Neurology of Budapest, we has been developing a, a model of where this information comes from. And then we in the West, uh, we are used to the, uh, the perceptual, cognitive, symbolic, neuroactional information. But there is something else too. There is the non-local, the perhaps macrotubular, according to Penrose Hammer of uh, theory, is formation is coming from other places too, you know, which are not the normal ones. And perhaps here dreams, you know, and you know the shamanic knowledge comes from. So I like that uh, Stanley um, um, used the term psychointegrator uh, from. Uh, uh, Michael Winkerman, I think that is a term that is not used at, at all. I, uh, you are the only f person who mentioned this here. Uh, the uh, institution I created in, in Brazil is called the, the, um, the Center for the Study of Psycho-Integrated Plants, Visionary Art and Consciousness, using this uh, very interesting term, which I think that is even more precise than any other other terms that we're using, because you have, with these substances, you have on the one side, you have integration of interhemispheric integration, you have uh, through the, uh, the serotonin pathway integration of the, the reptilian brain, the limbic system, the neocortex in that way, you have uh, emotional intellect integration, you have uh, family social integration. One of, the, one of the great functions I see, I think, in, in ayahuasca and when the tribe that still use it is that thanks to those, uh, the use of those plants, they are still able to maintain this social cohesion. Those uh, indigenous groups that continue using the, the, you know, the, the plants are those that are able to maintain, like the Shuar, like the Shipibo in Peru, like the Barasana in Colombia, and so on. And it's interesting that they, the, the first thing that missionaries do when they go to, the, to, to these places is to uh, uh, prohibit the use of these plants. You know, that's the, the first thing, the shaman and the plants. You know? so, so there is also the social integration, and then the ecosystemical integration, because that is something that uh, also happens uh, with the people taking it, is this you know, feeling of communion with nature, with the whole. So, in my own, after 25 years as an anthropologist, observing, well, taking the brew, of course, you know, but observing the work of the people, asking the people, the shamans, People started to ask me, you know, why don't you do it? You know, and I was very reluctant, but then at the end, I started to do myself sessions, and I've been doing it for the last eight years, and and I have seminars in my in, in this institution in southern Brazil, and there is, you know, I'm working on two ways. On, on one side is my scientific, uh, my you know, question, and the other hand, I'm doing the things myself, and this is the other uh, example I wanted to to, to say. In my own work, I see how, under the effects of ayahuasca, when we take the, the brew, I always take the brew, like the shamans, they all, always take the brew. It's not the, you know, the, you're observing the person, you know, you give the, the medicine to the person, observe, you know, from the outside, you may help. But taking it, you know, then you, somehow, you are on the same level. And what astonished me is where the information comes from. Because it seems to, you know, that at that, at that state, I know what to say. You know, there, of course, as you know, there are some crises, you know, sometimes people having very difficult situations, uh, regressions, and so on. But on the defects of the brew, somehow the right words, the right actions come. And I'm puzzled, you know. So perhaps this comes as uh, 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 the 
Frexka said, perhaps it's come from this void, the non-local, you know, which I don't know how we could study, but uh, I think that we have to be open to this other possibility. And of, of course, uh, well, um, uh, Franz Follin Weider was talking, you know, that the quantum, uh, uh, quantum phenomena in, in consciousness, you know, they're perhaps 10 years ahead of time before we can, you know, hardly understand. I think that we, we, we should, you know, get our thoughts and, and try to get somehow information about that. Thank you. Thank you for your reception. And I'm going to push the envelope a little bit because another one of my Latin American friends is here, Carlos Warter from Chile. And Carlos, I'm going to have you do a little cameo appearance here while I, if I can get this back on again, show the last slides. Come on, we're running out of time. How do we do this? While we're working on the audiovisuals, Carlos, let's hear a few words of wisdom from you. <laughs> Thank you, Stan. Greetings. Close to 40 years ago, I wrote a book, and my publisher said, were you on LSD? I felt offended. No. Keep I going. Had, it's coming up. I had never been on LSD, <laughs> but it opens the door of perception. We fortunately in Chile in those days had permission to experiment on ourselves, on our patients, on everyone. After rigorous medical training there in Harvard, I came across shamans in Peru and in Colombia. They showed me that my whole knowledge was like his insect of the Amazon, and that there was a way to reduce one's consciousness and expand our beingness. And I became a true believer. A true believer does not believe as an experiencer. A believer transforms the residence. And I shifted residence. I know that the gift of what we call entheogens has one purpose, which is to completely divinize our identity so that we not only live of the experiences that we can refresh and acquire in our rudimentary humanoid brain, but shift to the multidimensionality of the being that I am, that you are. And from then, on. I've worked with over 70,000 people around the world, not with the permission of the system, because the system is truly committed to the system. And I discovered that the true commitment, like Bahaudin Nashband, a Sufi of the 13th century said, the same ladder that entraps you in the world is the ladder to get you out of the world. We are in the presence, even though I fully agree with the enthusiasm of Christian Raj this morning, not of a community of people who are bound together by an experience, but we are in the presence of the divine, being re-experienced multifacetedly and multidimensionally over and over. And Maybe, maybe the powers that say they are had to crack down in the 60s and 70s so that we can turn the spiral and reawaken to the facts that the means that nature has given us, that when the indigenous follow the deer to eat the fruit that the deer and divinize the deer, they're still doing projective identification onto the deer and not knowing that that fruit is to reawaken you and me to the eternal 
unity that we are not mortal, but we are eternal beings of light manifesting in this realm of reality just with the purpose of spiritualizing or enlightening matter. The battle between matter and light is not such. It is like two arrows in a chemical equation. And whoever wins this, quote, battle, wins having the experience possibility in the next breath to reverse the flow. If we really establish a culture of peace and of heart, if we really not live the latest experience in our memory bank, but really reawaken that who we are are resonant forces of many dimensions consolidating here to transform the quality of Earth to what Earth is giving us to be able to transform ourselves with, then we'll have peace on Earth. If not, we'll continue on the saga that has no rush since our ancestor shamans and our present shamans are the same. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you very much, Carlos. Now, the last thing that I'm going to do is to tell you very quickly about the few experimental attempts that have been used. But first of all, in all justice, we have to remind the group that Albert Hoffman himself went to visit Maria Sabina. It was Gordon Wasson who first found out for sure that the mushrooms were still being used in Oaxaca among the Aztecs. He first visited Don Aurelio in 1953, Maria Sabina in 1955, which was when he took psilocybin and when he had his apparently purported telepathic experience that his son was going to draw, join the military, which seemed to was and observed. But when he got back, his son had run away from home and enlisted in the armed forces. And then Hoffman himself went down, gave Maria Sabina psilocybin, and she said, yes, the spirit of the mushroom is in these pills. A great endorsement for Hoffman's work. Now, I'm mentioning this because parapsychology did play a very vital role in getting Wasson involved in founding a new science, the science of ethnomycology. And Hoffman himself attended a conference sponsored by the Parapsychology Foundation, and this is published in their, in their records. I was able, I, again, I was invited to uh, attend the unveiling of Gordon Wasson's marvelous book, Soma, and I think he makes a good case. It's a controversial book, but read it, and the Soma in the Hindu Vedas could well have been sacred mushrooms. Well, there have been experiments by other people, Whittlesley, Pankey, Masters in Houston, Tinoco in Brazil, Don in Brazil, two groups of Dutch psychologists, Andre Puharich, Masters in Houston, probably did the most innovative study. You can read about that in their book, Varieties of Psychedelic Experience, in the bookstore. A new edition, on the back cover, there's a quote from me. I say this is one of the most important books of the century. And I don't say that only because Masters in Houston are two good friends of mine. I say it because it's the best phenomenological account of LSD-type drugs that I think has been published. Then two Italian investigators, Cavana and Cervidio, um, did a formal experiment with LSD, psilocybin, and a placebo. Osis administered practicing mediums LSD. None of this produced, shall we say, rigorously controlled uh, vertical data, but they were all very, very interesting pilot studies and maybe sometime this experimentation will be picked up again. So, in conclusion, what I would like to remind you of, first of all, another dear friend of mine, but a representative of the psychiatric mainstream, Sidney Cohen, in his book, The Beyond Within, stated his conviction that intuition, creativity, telepathic experience, prophecy, 
All can be understood as superior activities of the brain-mind function through LSD. And this is the vision shared by Albert Hoffman who wrote that in the LSD state, the boundaries between the experiencing self and the outer world dissolve. And these objects began to have a deeper meaning. In an auspicious case, the new ego feels blissfully united with the objects of the outer world and consequently also with fellow beings. This experience of deep oneness with the exterior world can even intensify to a feeling of the self being one with the universe. And if that is so, then you can see that there is room for serious consideration of what we are now calling parapsychological phenomena. In the meantime, I would like to reiterate what I said two days ago. We have gotten a lot of wisdom from the East. We've gotten a lot of wisdom from the West. Let's not forget that there is wisdom from the South, from Australia, from Africa, from Southeast Asia, and as we found out today, from Latin America. Thank you all for coming, and thanks to our guests for their words of wisdom. And we're ending in punto, exactamente in punto. Gracias a todos el mundo aquí.